Okay, six o'clock. I want to try and start on time. Respect, respect everyone's time here. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to this town hall about capital projects. Um, we'll kick off with just doing some introductions of the staff, um, and then I'll go ahead and walk through tonight's agenda. My name is Stephen Lynn. I'm the county manager, and in no particular order, Paul, just go down the line. And uh, any staff folks, if you could just. Raise your hand, introduce yourselves. Hi, I'm uh, Paul Andrus. I'm the community De development director for the county. Milo Shelton, the utilities manager. Good evening, Juan Rael, public works director. Julie yeah. Ann. Go ahead. I'll go. Um, I'm Ann Laurent, the Deputy County Manager. I'm Julie Williams Hill, the Public Information Officer. The technology challenge going for entire energy services. Wendy? Hi, Wendy Serby, Deputy Fire Chief, also a local fire. Head State Recreation Superintendent. Any other staff around? Um, Mr. Lynn, we have Eric. Eric Martinez is on Zoom. Okay. And Eric is the county engineer, so he's available. Any other staff? On, is Eric the only staff member on Zoom? Okay, so I have to remember this is a hybrid meeting, so there's folks online as well. <laughs> Try not to forget that. Um, and we do have our council chair here, Denise Durkix. Um, so welcome, everyone. Um, and can we put up the agenda? All right. Um, so where we're at today, we're about five weeks out from publishing our proposed budget for fiscal year 24. Um, so really the, our primary purpose is to gather some in, input related to a piece of the county's budget. Um, we wanna talk a little bit about the county's maintenance of existing assets versus us building new amenities. Uh, a quick overview of our capital improvement planning process, uh, talk a little bit about uh, strategic goals and priorities. Uh, a bulk of, of what we wanna go through here are uh, giving you some information about our existing capital projects um, and also uh, responses that we recently got from the community survey related to uh, capital projects. All that whole first part, we're gonna try and limit um, us standing up here talking to 30, 45 minutes tops. Um, then we're gonna talk, and, and there's actually a, a list of potential future capital projects that we're really looking for specific feedback on. Uh, we'll go through that list. Um, we've got time for questions and answers and additional comments, um, but this is somewhat informal here tonight. So. If you feel the need along the way to raise your hand and ask a clarifying question, please do that. If that's just gonna help help folks understand things better. Um, but we will have the, the question and answers. And then, the, and then we're looking for formal feedback on that list of capital projects. And we'll ask folks to take a, a quick survey associated with that. So that's what we're gonna try and get through here. Um, my goal is um, tops two hours, um, but we'll see how things go. Um, could go quicker, could go slower. Um, so when I talk about the purpose, um, so I already mentioned we're working on the proposed budget. Um, by charter, we have to pr uh, publish that at the end of March. Our budget hearings, um, so for those of you that are 
interested in what goes into the county's budget. Um, there's a lot of different opportunities to provide input. Um, it's uh, budget hearings is just one mechanism. Um, anytime before budget hearings, um, and really uh, anytime while we're in budget development, um, you can always send in emails. There'll be some contact information at the end of the slides here. Um, our budget hearings this year are scheduled April 17th, 18th, 24th, and 25th. Um, so at the end of those hearings, uh, council will consider the entire budget, including the capital plan. Um, so again, uh, tonight's focus is just on a, a small piece of the budget. Um, that capital plan will include what we're appropriating for, for new projects in FY24. It also includes a 10-year projection. Um, and, and that'll be important because part of what we're looking at here is more than just a single year. Um, and so what we really want tonight is uh, to get you familiar with our capital program and to look for feedback on those specific projects. So uh, maintaining existing assets versus building new assets. I, I just think it's important to highlight this. I know recently we've, the county's received uh, several comments along this line, and it was also discussed by council during their recent strategic planning session. Um, within the county policies, we actually have an obligation um, and, and directive policy to maintain our existing assets. Um, that's an essential basic function. Um, just a few weeks ago when council was finalizing their strategic planning, um, they also re-emphasized this point. Um, and basically by uh, letting us know that as we evaluate our assets and infrastructure, we really should be prioritizing funding the maintenance of our existing assets and then considering new investments. Um, I know that folks from time to time have concerns when a particular asset seems like it's falling into disrepair. Um, and sometimes um, that is part of the natural life cycle of assets. Um, not every asset is um, gonna be replaced halfway through its life, so it's always shiny and new. Um, however, there are times when, for, what, for a variety of reasons, um, some assets fall further along that scale of disrepair than we would like to see happen. Um, and it's up to us to stay on top of it and, and minimize that from happening. Um, I'm going to go off script a little bit. Um, I recognize a lot of hockey jerseys in the audience and got a request. And I, and I know there's going to be some public comment on this point specifically related to the ring. So um, rather than waiting till the end, um, and for those that do want to stay, um, I would actually encourage that because there's a lot of information we're going to share. Um, and there is an open-ended question at the end of that survey. So anything that, um, you know, we don't capture here, there's, again, plenty of opportunities for input. But I do want to go ahead and grab one of these mics and, and pass it over so that a couple of the ice rinks folks can make a few comments. Um, Is it on? Yeah. Okay. Bob, are you going to start? Okay. Thank you. Sure thing. Thank you very much, uh, Administrator Lynn and all the staff that are here tonight. Thank you for being here and, and putting this presentation on for us. One of the things I wanted to do was to also compliment you all for the locker rooms you provided to us in the past years. They've been a great asset to our facility, our hockey, and we want to make sure you understand our complaints are not about what you've done. 
we're at the end of the life cycle of the chiller system. I'm, I was on the old IROS committee. It was IROS in those days. It was 20 years ago. It's now IRRAS, name change, same function. And we um, monthly meet on helping the management with managing the ring. I don't mean the activities, but what do they need help with? One of the things we saw this past year is that we canceled a lot of games. The most recent one was only a week ago. Well, on a Friday night, our last high school hockey game with a team from Albuquerque. They came up here and had to cancel because the ice was not any good, literally. It's been going on like this from the beginning of December, middle of November, December. We barely got off the, the, the tack, so to speak, to be able to even host practices for a week. And that's because the system is... 20 years old, it's over 20 years old, I believe by one, maybe two years. And that night, when they had to cancel the high school game, there was only one pump left and it went out. There's three compressors. So I understand now, and I want to say this to all of you, is that this summer, the pumps are going to be repaired they'll be working in october hopefully is the plan and then an rfp is going out to replace all of that if i understood that right is that right Corey? am i close anybody else know <laughs> it's okay that's the plan okay but I, I want you to know they got on this as soon as they could because they couldn't work on the pump while it was running because then it would be the same thing again. It, went, it would be down. Well, it went down anyway. So understand that also this CIP doesn't, I don't think, impacts that because that's um, maintenance monies. And it doesn't come through this. Is that correct? This CIP is a different pot of dollars, et cetera? Um, most likely not but it, it could be, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll get into that a little okay. bit later when okay. we go down the list. Okay. So we just wanted to make sure that everyone else here knew there's a plan, they're working on it, and we hope we'll all be ready to go back to playing hockey, um, hopefully before next uh, December 1st. The past two years, we've only been able to start hockey on December 1st. Before that, we we're able to start hockey at about the middle of November. But the weather on top of that has been so bad in the past two or three years in the, in the fall, bad meaning not enough cold weather, that the very difficult to keep the ice going. So what's got to happen is we believe, I believe, there needs to be a cover. And no, it's not the first time you've heard of this. At least 10 years ago, this was brought up, studied, and defeated for a number of reasons. But the only way we can keep this going on a consistent basis, even with downed compressors, is we've got to be able to keep the sun off of the surface. And many of us discussed a um, retractable cover, whether it could be simple for right now and then maybe study it and put in something a lot more rigorous. And only when it's necessary would we put the cover up, not keep it up all the time. So that's one of our requests. The other one is, as I understand it, is that the piping in the concrete is leaking and probably is gonna to have to tear all that up and replace it. My guess is that all now becomes capital. So that's where I am from my perspective on the, as president of the Hockey Association and the, on the IROS committee. 
You want to speak, Andres? This is Andres Surtex, our uh, one of our um, uh, mic coach. Hello, yeah, my name is Andre. I uh, was a might coach for about seven years, and this year I uh, was a scorer's coach. It's 10 and under, and I think um, uh, Bob uh, described the technical difficulties, and I wanted to just say a few words why I think uh, that the county and, and Los Alamos uh, should support hockey in the first place. I think, um, well, first of all, I think hockey, of course, as a hockey coach, I think is the best sport, but also I think... Um, it's a very good avenue for our kids uh, to do something that's meaningful, that builds character. Hockey is a team sport, and so you learn when to lead, when to follow. Uh, it's a tough sport. Uh, you know, you, sometimes it hurts, but in hockey, we don't cry. We get up and play. Um, you learn sometimes during the games, uh, you know, <laughs> the opposite team, sometimes they don't play fair, and it happens. Um, but we don't cry about it. We do our best, uh, given what we have. Uh, and so I think it just builds a lot of uh, life lessons. I think almost all the life lessons you can find in hockey. And so it's, I think it's a great sport for us in Los Lamos to support. And I think if um, we do something, we should do it to our best abilities. And I think in Los Lamos, we have the resources to figure out how to get the ice running um, so that we can practice. It's a short season, but it's a very intense season. And so I think we can keep it running. I think um, it would improve a lot of things and it's a great, a great avenue for all the kids. Thank you. I'm gonna butt in here. Um, is this on? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, I think we've made a number of really good arguments and we have a really good representation among the kids of this town, as well as the high schoolers, I think maybe. Yeah. Um, that hockey is an important part of Los Alamos, but I also think it's overlooked. We just had a few weeks ago or maybe a month and a half ago, a experience in this town where we brought a couple of junior teams, one from Albuquerque and then another from El Paso. And it was a really great event. And I think it's overlooked that as Los Alamos looks at what it can do for itself as a town beyond certain legacy items, that there's a significant selling point behind having a functional and sustainable ice rink that can support having folks coming here from El Paso, Odessa, from Durango and other places that, you know, from a very selfish perspective, and, you know, I've a kid that plays hockey right now so i'm doubly selfish but we have the opportunity to bring people to see our town to visit it that is not replicated elsewhere and investing in the rink can be a very important point not just for supporting the children in town and the program in town but also as a factor in attracting visitors and in really building up the stature of los alamos as a destination. So that's all. Thank you. Hi, my name is Chantel Hansen, and I have two kids that are currently in the program in Los Alamos. And I also was a peewee coach and a squirts coach. So that's 12 and under and 10 and under. Um, and I helped to organize the holiday tournament that we host every year up here in Los Alamos. And I can speak to you just from that tournament in, in and of itself. The ice situation was a nightmare. And this is December 26th to the 30th. So no time should the ice be better than the end of December to the beginning of January. And it was melting and we had puddles and we had to cancel games. We had teams in from Texas. We had teams from all over the state that had come in. They were giving us their money to join the tournament, but also they were giving hotel dollars. They were supporting local businesses by eating in towns. We had put out lists and other things about where everyone could eat and who was open during that time frame, and all of those things. And then we had teams asking, can we get our money back? Cause we only got one of the three games we were supposed to get. And then we're kind of up a Creek because we needed all that money to support what we had to do to get refs there and buy the ice time and do all of those things and we didn't have ice. And so teams were not happy. Teams were very frustrated about that. And it was a very hard position to be in as someone who is organizing the tournament, but yet has no control over this chiller system working or not working. 
And even some of the games that we played, we had to, we had cones on the ice and we set up games like one game we knew was going to be pretty lopsided. So we didn't change sides at the game because we knew one team would be on offense more than the other team. And we didn't want anything happening behind the goal because it was a puddle back there. And I would say a lot of our practices, we have sections of the ice coned off. I mean, it's just, it's an untenable situation as a hockey coach and as a hockey parent to have every day, you're wondering, are we going to have practice or not? Like, is the ice good? And someone has to go to the ice and check the ice to see if we can actually skate on the ice. And, you know, we're not talking, (laughs) excuse me, at the end of February or March when we know the ice tends to get bad, right? We're talking middle of the season. And so, and this was not that the only time that that happened. It happened at the beginning of the season. It happened then it happened again. I, at least three or four times the chiller has gone down and every time we're told, Oh, it's going to be fixed. It's going to be fixed, but we don't know when it's going to be fixed. And then this last time they said, well, a squirrel chewed a wire. And I'm thinking, how is this my life? Like, how is that a possible thing that happens that ruins the end of hockey season? That a squirrel chews a wire that fries a pump. And now they've noticed there's been no coolant in the system for who knows how long because there's leaks. So it feels like kind of how you were saying they've they've brought up this, they're obligated to maintain existing assets. That feels like it's not being maintained at all. And it's really frustrating as a hockey parent, as a coach. Um, and it's, I mean, we have hundreds of kids in our program. I don't know how many Adams or mini mites did we have? Do you know? Uh, 55. So we have 55 at the six and under six and under. We have 55 kids plus, you know, 30 or so probably at every other level or more. Um, so it's a lot of kids and they also tried to bring women's hockey this year and they only got to practice three or four times because the ice was so bad every time they wanted to practice. So we need a solution. We need this ice to be fixed. Otherwise we're going to lose kids to playing hockey. And there's not a lot for kids to do in Los Alamos. So we want them to keep playing hockey. Thank you very much, Chantel. <laughs> Thank you. So something I've been thinking about is recently we've been tearing down a bunch of buildings And then we're building a ton of apartment buildings and leaving a bunch of other things left behind, like the ice rink. And also one more thing, a couple of years ago, uh, I forget what year was it, but there was a petition in town to build something, to build like an indoor ice rink here. And that flopped. And I feel like we should try to start something up again because that might actually work this year with the change. Hi, my name is Kermit Short. Um, This young man represents the fourth generation of my family to grow up in Los Alamos. Um, The ice rink has always been something we really look forward to and enjoy. It's involved family traditions. It's involved lots of lessons to learn how to skate, um, figure skating, um, now hockey, and um, Obviously, we all really enjoy this rink, and and we really want to make sure that we make the most of it and and keep it going into the future. Thank you. One quick thing I didn't note that I was going to say earlier: parking is becoming has become one of our biggest uh, issues down there because when DOE fenced it off, it cut out probably, believe it or not, fifty parking space easily. I understand the county has a study started up and it's going to be to look at the upper uh, parking lot as to what might be able to be done there. There's more land there and so they're going to be trying to look at that in a study. So there's more going on. We just don't hear about a lot of it. Thank you. Thank you so much for doing this for us. Um, Thank Thank you. Oh, we do have one hand up online, so I didn't didn't, didn't let's know. Let's go. For, let's go forward. Okay, and then... uh, Mr. Meadows, if you'd like to make your comments now, you can do so. Great. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Perfect. Hey, thanks. I really appreciate um, giving us the opportunity to to speak our mind here, and I think um, people have done an excellent job of that. So I don't know how much more I can add. I would just say. 
Um, this has been something that's in just has been in discussion for many years. Uh, I think I've been in talks about it for about 10 years. Um, the, the, the concerns at this point are we really have to get the sun off the ice. Um, you know, I understand there's the other maintenance activities are, are going forward in some fashion or another, and that's excellent. Um, I think in line with maintaining the, the facilities, in line with the council direction, in line with the uh, community surveys, maintaining existing facilities is a, pri a you know a priority at this point. Um, this this needs to be near the top. Um, we are at the point now where this is not a discussion about, uh, in my opinion, extending the season. This is a discussion about whether we have a season. And you know there are ways that we can we can tackle this from retractable type covers to temporary type um, uh, shade options. And so I would just ask that uh, there be uh, budgeting put in place for next season, prior to next season, to get some sort of temporary coverage over the ice, so that we can have. Uh, the, the season we expect and that's and that's just the, the the standard season and then look for future budgeting of um permanent improvements that could could uh include a cover uh retractable or open air there's plenty of examples of the types of of uh covers that can maintain that open air feel uh, throughout the country and this would really really go a long ways to um uh, having a facility that's usable, that's consistent, that we can have teams come in from from um, out of state, from in state, uh, and and have the experience that we expect without so many um, hiccups and and uh, just fluctuations and uh, issues that we've had. So again, I appreciate it. I would really request that that this be prioritized for both near term, near term and long term, and that the studies be budgeted and engineering estimates be budgeted to try to make a permanent solution down there. Appreciate it. Thanks for your time. And uh, um, again, just really appreciate uh, listening to the comments. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I wanna say thanks to everyone that, that commented. I very much appreciate um, you making the point that was on the slide in real life, you know, real life example. Um, 21 years ago, I was in the back of the room where Erica was sitting. I was the budget officer then. I remember Carl Reich up here pitching to council the refrigeration system. So I remember that project and yeah, it, it, it's time. So uh, we hear you um, and and just stay tuned and, and look for those things to, to move ahead. Um, I'm gonna continue with the rest of this. Um, anyone that is here, with kids and wants to get home, or you're here only to comment about the rink, you're not gonna insult anyone if you get up and go. Like I said before, I encourage folks to hear the rest of it, but uh, part of the reason I wanted to move those comments up was to make the point, but also uh, be respectful of, of those with younger kids as well. So uh, feel free to... Oh. Here you go. Sometimes my brother came home and said they lost because they got the bad part of the rink that was total smush. No one could skate on it. So, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Okay, so we're, we're gonna continue on, um, talk a little bit about our capital planning process. Um, and I'm still gonna encourage the rest of us to go relatively quickly so we get to all the other uh, questions and answers. So um, I do want folks to be aware that there is a significant process that goes into our capital planning. Um, it varies department to department, division to division. Uh, these projects don't just magically appear. Um, we have a lot of 
guiding documents uh, that set some foundation for us, like our strategic plan, our comprehensive plan, uh, our downtown master plans. Uh, we do a fair bit of assessment and surveys. Um, some examples there, we do a pavement condition index. Um, right now, community services is right in the middle of an integrated master plan. So we're gonna have a lot of new information feeding into the, this next process. Um, and then we go through a lot of the typical project planning activities, uh, initial design and scoping, initial cost estimates. Um, once projects actually get approved, we'll do the final design. We'll make sure they're budgeted. Um, implement the projects. Um, notice maintenance. Maintenance is on the list. That's part of our cycle. Um, and we and we go through it every year and we start over again. Um, again, let me just reiterate. We are typically looking five to ten years out. Some in some cases longer. Um, some of our utility assets um, have a much longer life, and the planning cycle is longer. So it it, it really varies depending upon the the activities. Um, I think I alluded to this earlier. Our county council just recently went through their strategic planning process. So I thought, and and one of the things we're going to try and do with this year's budget, uh, to the extent we can, and certainly with our capital program, is try and group things under these broader goals. Um, so I just wanted to highlight, um, this is the overview diagram, and you'll see this in, in different ways over the next couple months as we go through our budget development cycle. Um, I'm not gonna read through it all, but I will mention, if we probably easier to see on the next slide, um, most of our capital projects fall into one of, the three broad goals. There's five in general, uh, quality governance, operational excellence, economic vitality, quality of life, and environmental stewardship. Those are the five broad areas. Um, as we we're trying to categorize our capital projects, it seems like most of them fell into one of three areas. Um, either operational excellence, economic vitality, or quality of life. Um, so we've tried our best to categorize them this way. Um, you know, quite frankly, many of these could have gone in two or three different buckets, um, but we tried to get a certain amount of consistency here. Um, I'm gonna pass the mic now, and we're gonna start walking through our existing capital projects. Uh, the purpose here is just to give you a sense of scope and variety. There's quite a lot actively going on in our capital program. Um, and I, I just wanna mention, you know, part of, part of the background here is there's a lot in progress. Um, and quite frankly, some of it over the past couple of years has gotten backlogged because of COVID and supply chain issues. You've all heard that, it's actually real. It has slowed things down some for us. Um, add to that uh, big spike in inflation. So our capacity, to add a lot of new things to our capital plan is somewhat limited. Um, so that's part of the backdrop here as well. Sure, sure, go ahead, Bob. What is your level of funding to label this capital? That's a good question. Um, our capital projects, um, we, used to, we used to have a more strict definition, um, but typically it's something greater than 200,000, I'd say is the, um, lower. It is the lower limit. Um, you, you can see occasionally a capital project below that amount. Um, you can, you can also see, in addition to the, the ones you see in our capital improvement fund, we also have small park projects that are operational. We have facility maintenance projects that are operational. Um, so there's a, there are other places where we do more maintenance type projects. Um, 
Conversely, you'll also see in our capital program, a lot of maintenance or routine replacement projects. So we're not often building new roads, but we're often replacing existing ones. Um, so with that, that's probably a good segue to toss it over to Juan. Um, We've got one question on the line before, oh, before we go, is that all right? Sure. Uh, Jared, you can make your, ask your question now. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Um, so I'm just looking at this list and I know we don't want to get into the gory details, but what is the New Mexico four crossing and multi-use trail improvement project? And what is the taxiway safety project? Um, so Mr. Rayel is going to go over that now. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, so this list represents a mix of mostly roadway projects and they're all in various stages of study design or for example, the Arkansas 33rd, 34th Street, um, soon to be construction. And so like Steve mentioned, this is another symptom of, of what we're seeing. The 33rd, 34th, for example, started off as a great idea um, in conjunction with the Department of Public Utilities to replace some underground utilities. So that way the disruption to this residence is only one time instead of two. Um, but unfortunately the first time this project was bid, it was it was zero bids were received. And the second time we just received the one. So it's just something that we're also struggling <clears throat> with, excuse me. And we're looking at different ways to try to become competitive. Um, the reality of is with uh, with our road projects, we're sort of small potatoes in the overall state of New Mexico. And so we're we're challenged with trying to to get contractors to even bid our work, but we're not, uh, we're not done trying uh, innovative ways. And so this list is, is just sort of the overall um, roadway uh, with some other things mixed in. Um, and so each of these projects is in various levels and they're also a various funding. Some, a lot of these have state funding, uh, federal funding in addition to the capital CIP. In specific, the um, question about the New Mexico four crossing. So this crossing is in the Sherwood La Vista area um, near the new subdivision of Mirador in White Rock um, as part of the overall um, sort of master plan of, of that area, there is a mixed use development that uh, that is slated to begin soon. Um, and with that is actually the, the, the sort of triggering of a signal that'll be at Sherwood or um, and New Mexico for, but until that um, is fully built, um, we also looked at other areas for potential crossings and that's what this project represents. So this was actually a state grant um, that the county applied for and received looking at a secondary crossing along New Mexico for so we're, we're looking at a little towards the La Vista area so a little bit um, down from where Sherwood is um, and tying into the uh, the existing trail network that's there and the taxiway project is is out of the airport and so currently we're in the preliminary engineering report stage of this project but really what it is is it's it's working with the NMDOT and the FAA to to do a redesign of of the the taxiway uh, on the eastern side of the airport, which really is is well out of current design standards, and so that's what that one represents. Thank you. Thanks, Juan. Um, and I'm glad you pointed out coordination with utilities, um, as we that that's part of our planning effort uh, and a significant one. Um, Philo, you want to cover the utility projects? Yes, and I, I might add on the taxiway project, generally FAA funds 90% of the funds, so that 10 million is funded by federal government. Um, and then, uh, so with utilities, we have uh, gas, water, sewer, and electric uh, that we manage. And within electric, you have uh, electric production and electric distribution. And uh, we key categorize those in the two different areas because uh, production is we generally share the costs with the laboratory. Uh, they use 80% of the electricity uh, that's brought in the town and we, we as a community use 20%. Uh, so there's some large projects in here, um, but we you'll see it's about equal investment in each of the funds. Um, and that's primarily due to uh, distribution uh, we had a lot of uh, underground uh, faults and, and that caused some outages. Uh, then there is some other outages related to the laboratory side with uh, 
uh, a substation upgrade, uh, some new equipment didn't hold up uh, and had to be replaced. So there's there's two different sides of our industry that cause outages, uh, and we're working towards improving those reliability. So with that, you'll see uh, a list of hydroelectric projects that's in coordination with the ABIQ, with the Corps of Engineers. And then uh, the Bureau of Reclamation is refacing the Elvado Dam. And so we're trying to get some of the communication systems in while, while that dam's under renovation. And uh, then under electric distribution, um, the underground uh, replacement program at 1.2 million, that's to replace uh, the buried cables. Over time, uh, the cables sheaths around the wire deteriorates, and so it requires replacement. Uh, back in the late 70s and 80s, uh, a direct buried cable was the technology at the time, but it's proven that it doesn't hold up uh, as long as we had hoped, and uh, uh, that's just through a test of time. And so these projects we're looking at uh, putting conduit and then having wire, so should there be outages, you could re-pull new wire through. Uh, so, you know, it, it takes a little more capital to uh, invest, but it, it should help with uh, improving our reliability overall. So um, in here, and I'm gonna, you'll see here some of the lower numbers of designs usually will be in that 50 to 100,000 range, knowing there'll be another construction project later. So that will add up to more dollars. Uh, rule of thumb is designs 10, 15% of the construction costs. So, uh, and then uh, under gas, um, we we have a, a, a SCADA project. Uh, that's the uh, supervisory control and data access. That's what SCADA means. And that's just uh, how we can manage how gas comes into town. And, and uh, that's important for moderating uh, pressures. And uh, uh, we're gonna, gonna be taking over the Elk Ridge uh, mobile home park gas system. So we have an evaluation budgeted for that. Uh, New Mexico four transmission line. Uh, New Mexico DOT has a road construction project proposed from the truck route to Rover. Uh, we have a buried concrete reinforced uh, water supply line that's aging. And uh, we've put in for some grant funding and received uh, 400,000 from the state for design the project. And then uh, we're also in the process of uh, seeking loan funding, loan and grant funding from the Water Trust Board of roughly $5 million. So these projects are big, but we try to leverage these dollars as best we can. Uh, the LA Canyon Restoration Project is is a, a biological uh, shoring of the road edges with willows and plantings and try to keep maintain the, the channel, the creek in the channel and not wash up onto the access road up to the Los Alamos Reservoir. Uh, so that's what that project is. And we got a grant uh, uh, of 250,000 for that from the state. And then uh, uh, you'll see some other booster station refurbishments, our uh, pumping system. We have to lift water, you know, between uh, 1,000 and 2,000 feet uh, up into our tanks. And so these uh, pump stations need to be refurbished from time to time. The pumps wear out just like uh, the ice rink pumps wear out or compressors, similar equipment. Uh, then on wastewater treatment, we have... Um, we're looking at replacing some lift stations in kind and others where we are able to uh, take advantage of boring technology and bore a, a hole through the canyon and line it and run a pipe and flow that wastewater by gravity down to the wastewater plant. That obviously saves on pumping costs uh, once you put that investment in place and, uh, and it, it eliminates uh, potential first backups or you know if a lift station should fail uh, overflow events so that's real important for water quality and and quality of life within the community and uh, at our Los Alamos plant we have a belt filter press it's 
uh, wearing out. And uh, so we have to replace that equipment. And you'll see some other uh, design assessments here for future projects at the plant. So that should wrap up our utilities, unless there's questions. Thanks, Philo and Ron. And I, I, I think, I don't know if I missed it, but for both those last two, oh, and, and yes, question, go ahead. Oh, yes. Well, uh, thank you. Um, so it's not a question, it's just a, a suggestion that we. Um, Reemphasized to the public that the utilities uh, funds and the general county funds cannot be intermixed, that all the utility projects are funded by the utility rates. So perhaps you can say more about that. I think it's important for the public to understand that. Um, I'll, I'll address that. Thank you for highlighting that. Um, I did. I did want to mention that the the road projects that Juan covered and the utility ones all fell under our operational excellence goal. Um, and the point that uh, Chair Dirkitz made is a good one. Um, most of our capital projects are general and governmental in nature, um, and those are funded uh, primarily out of general county revenues, uh, property taxes, gross receipts taxes. For those functions that are enterprise type functions, so the utility function, the airport, the environmental services fund, our transit fund, um, our fire department, those are all funded primarily by user fees. So um, they uh, generally don't have general fund money coming to them. And utilities specifically is restricted from uh, having general fund revenues pay for operations or capital. Um, it's supposed to be all user fee. Um, so that's important as we look at these going forward. Um, the next grouping falls under economic vitality, and I think Paul's going to cover those, but Ann's got a question online. Thank you for keeping me on track with what's going on online. Thank you, Ann. Jared, you should be unmuted and can ask your question now. So this question relates to the electrical infrastructure improvement project. I see no forward-looking projects that are dealing with in-town uh, photovoltaic solar generation, microgrids within residences. I know there's a lot of private residences that have solar, and this may not be quite the appropriate place, but I think the county needs to start thinking about electrical generation within the region and increasing the, the private residence generation beyond the limit of what private houses use because you can flow that electricity into the grid and provide additional electrical production for the community. And so what is the what is the county doing along those lines? That sure sounds like a philo kind of utility question. <laughs> um, so as far as uh, distributive solar energy is, is uh, what you were speaking to about uh, the amount of solar people can put on their homes. Uh, that is something uh, we're looking into whether we can enhance that further. Right now, the board uh, had set a goal of having uh, six megawatts generated locally. Uh, we're a little over three megawatts uh, generated locally by just through homeowners uh, through this distributive solar. I, I do think it's an area that will, over time, that we're going to need to study in look at how to expand and enhance that as um, a, some homeowners now, for example, are looking at uh, battery storage and how, how that can work. Uh, there's quite a bit of technology uh, that, that runs into that issue. And um, it, it has to do with, uh, you know, take a day like today when uh, the weather came in and the sun didn't shine 
we still need to provide the power in the town for the homes when they go home and want to cook dinner. Uh, that mix could change as battery storage uh, locally becomes available. So we are looking at uh, doing a battery uh, solar siting study in coordination um, with the laboratory. And we have a project we're working with laboratory on right now for eight to 10 megawatts of solar at the laboratory site. And as well as uh, some local Pueblos have been experienced express some interest for uh, citing some solar on their land. Uh, so we are in process of looking at these various uh, projects. And uh, then we also have other generating projects that we're pursuing uh, geothermal uh, with the uh, UAMPS partnership, as well as uh, the Carbon Free Power Project, which is a small modular nuclear reactor in Idaho that uh, we're pursuing. So we're trying to diversify the portfolio so you have a blend of renewables and um, firm power that runs around the clock like geotech and uh, geothermal and, and nuclear. Thanks, Philo. Okay, Paul's gonna do a quick summary on the economic vitality capital projects. I always learn so much when I'm after following Philo. Um, so this slide's going to look a little bit different from the other um, project areas in that, you know, we know we have a housing um, challenge here in Los Alamos, and there's certain activities that we can pursue um, as the county in partnership with private development. And one of the ways in which we can do that is we can donate land if it's associated with what we call an affordable housing project. So there's two projects um, on the west side of DP Row that both we've donated um, land to those projects, uh, about approximately a $5 million value. We also do uh, provide um, on a case-by-case -case basis, when the opportunity arises, we can support um, infrastructure development, bringing in utilities to support the project. Um, ultimately, the county will own and operate and ma maintain those, those improvements. Um, so a couple things here, we have a placeholder on two of these items, and that is, um, as, as Steve had mentioned, we're, we're projecting out over time um, when the county might have an opportunity to support a project uh, for housing that we we have a placeholder that we can go to um, and then council would budget for that um, on project basis. And you can probably explain that a little bit better. Yeah, than I'm, I'm going to jump in because you'll see you'll see this later on. You'll see some dollar estimates and then sometimes the word placeholder would be next to it. I think it's important for me to highlight real quickly the difference. Um, if it doesn't say placeholder, then it's a project we've done some development on, some conceptual work, some estimating. If it says placeholder, we don't have a specific project yet, but we know there's needs in that area, and, and we don't want to leave that just giant gap in our, in our capital planning. So we actually started this as part of last year's capital planning, putting in some, again, just placeholders. Um, so that we don't underestimate uh, in a very sort of gross way, the overall needs. Okay, keep going, Paul, yeah, sorry. So um, specifically on this slide, uh, the Finch Street project is actually associated with the Hills uh, apartments that are being built right now by the, next to the hospital. Um, but what the ultimate, so the project will involve the realignment of 35th Street and the upgrades to the utilities serving that area, but there's also intending to be a connection um, to the hospital parking lot as well. And so that would provide an additional access point to the hospital um, that hopefully will be, you know, add to the safety of getting in and out of that uh, location. The North Mesa housing infrastructure is project, a process really at this stage where we've been uh, talking with the, the schools about looking at their uh, 30 acre site at North Mesa next to the middle school as a potential housing development. And that is still in the planning discussion phases. Uh, DP Road is really more about mixed use and economic development, and that that is another project where we have funded money for that, but uh, bids have come back uh, through Public Works, and we're we're feeling that pinch now, or we're looking at what opportunities we might have 
to address that because we're not uh, we're not fully budgeted for that. Is that safe to say, Juan? Based on all of the things coming in. Uh, the next slide, just again, looking at um, different types of placeholders um, in anticipation of development projects in the downtown and in the White Rock Town Center. Um, when the opportunity arises that the county can participate or provide support to a project and it's eligible for that, those are placeholders to, um, to, to play that role. The Deacon Street project has been um, contemplated now, I wanna say for eight years is something, it goes back to when almost when I first came into town. And that really now has been, we, we really are excited about potential for uh, redevelopment um, in, in Los Alamos downtown. And should the, uh, should the opportunity arise, we would look at using these funds in participation of addressing a redevelopment of that Deacon Street area and associated with, the, with a redevelopment project. Um, the White Rock Visitor Center, uh, we have experienced some, um, I guess, stress in terms of during the, the uh, tourism season for that facility down in White Rock. And this project is to um, increase the capacity of the restrooms down there and, and, and expand restroom facilities um, at the Visitor Center and also bring in some opportunities for uh, a space for food trucks as well to serve folks that are getting on the shuttle and coming in and out of town. Um, and did you wanna talk about broadband? Uh, sure, um, so um, we did uh, hire just over a year ago, a broadband manager, his name's Jerry Smith. Um, if you're interested in broadband, he's um, wonderful to talk to about what he's been working on, but there's two aspects of it. One is um, at the end of January, we had um, with, with the help of a consultant um, study that we are com we've completed, um, updated a 10 year old um, idea of fiber to the home for high speed access, uh, internet access for everyone. And this concept of an open access network where um, we can uh, attract ad additional providers, service providers and um, manage that as more of a essential infrastructure um, through that process. So um, where we have approval to do through, go through an RFP process and look for a partner on that for an operator and uh, maintenance for um, implementing a community-based broadband fiber to the home. Um, but that is a, a several year initiative. It's not gonna happen overnight, but we um, are starting that process, which is exciting. And then the middle mile is, is really the fiber out of the community. Right now we're all beholden to one provider of a fiber. Um, the county has put a microwave connection on our municipal building to help with the county's service um, redundancy in the event of an outage so that our public Wi-Fi stays up. Um, but that remains a significant concern. And so we do have ongoing conversations with regional partners to try to get ad an additional fiber line off the hill so that we can create that redundancy and not um, have the issues that we experienced in December. Okay. Our next group are the quality of life projects. I'm gonna pass the mic over to Corey. Corey's doing that. You say placeholder, do you start putting that in a budget request the next year or do you just sort of push it out? So uh, that's a good question. Our Again, our capital plan is 10 years. So most of these placeholders are within the next three to four years. Corey. Well, thank you, Steve. Um, most of the lists that we have have been ongoing for a number of years. Uh, we have a social services hub with a $5 million placeholder. Uh, this would be to develop a central service area for those that may have a food, behavioral health, uh, life-changing services in one location so we don't have to send them across town. About 800000 for the Senior Center Kitchen at Betty Hart. It's an integral program that we need to upgrade. Uh, a lot of this is funded through state aging and long-term services grants, uh, but this helps really with our older citizens that may have uh, food needs. Uh, it really helps with a congregate meal setting as well as meals delivered to home. Uh, we also recently, we had council talk about a food composting facility down in Bio Canyon. This would 
help with our desire to continue to reduce our footprint with waste and hauling things off the hill. Uh, the Canyon Rim Trail Project, this is a, another one that's a continuation of a larger project. Uh, this specifically will add extension to the trail and connect it to the urban trail. So we'll not only be able to basically go the entire length of our uh, county east and west, but you'll be able to cross over through downtown, through the historic district and connect up over by the aquatic center. Uh, the urban trail project is that cross uh, the town site trail project up here. Uh, there's a downtown transit center study as part of this to look and try to optimize not only our bus service with our county service, but also provide a hub that maybe we can get some better distribution to Lanel uh, from a downtown hub. And if Juan or Ann, you wanna add anything to that? Uh, we have a great opportunity with the Women's Army Corps Dormitory. We got about a $4 million there. Uh, we're finishing up some initial design concepts for that. Uh, as many of you know, we have the golf course improvements. It's been longstanding and, and been moving forward. Uh, the next one is one that's been around since 2015. It was designed as a, uh, a fund to improve mountain bike trails up on the mountain. Uh, we're going to have a conversation uh, with council uh, next week about rescoping that plan and make it more of a, maybe a, a trails, open space, um, non-motorized conversation document, maybe reallocate those funds that have been sitting around here for a while. Uh, we have community rec space in Los Alamos, which received $400,000 from the state to do some design study. This is under the name right now, the North Mesa Gymnasium. This would be a partnership with the school district and would put a, a design space that's still being worked on um, right there uh, on the middle school campus off of San Altafonso there. Uh, the county was also successful in getting another $600,000 uh, for some state funds for some additional community space in White Rock. The county has already allocated that funding to additional recreation space that is in the final stages of design at the new Pinion Elementary and Chamisa Elementary redesign that the school district's going under. So they give us some increased gym space, some increased public meeting space, and um, upgrade the school district from what's called minimum adequacy for the school district so they can have some additional facilities that we can use as a community. We still have our tween center, uh, a nice facility for those in the middle school range. Uh, we've got a 5 million placeholder there for that. In the very near future, council will be seeing the um, selected locations and uh, funding options. Uh, we did have some money to do a tennis court study for tournament quality courts. Uh, this is important for several factors. One, our current bunching of courts that we have at Urban are, are mostly four. We really need six for to be able to do New Mexico athletic association tournaments for our local kids in high school. And then we also need a minimum five plex for um, USTA adult and junior tournaments to be held in our community. And this would help with both of those. Um, give us a quality opportunity for some tennis courts, as well as the opportunity to potentially repurpose some additional courts to other means. So before we leave this slide, um, thank you, Corey. Were you done? Were you done? I thought so. Okay. I almost felt like I was cutting you off. And that was not my intention. But um, I do want to highlight two things on this slide. Um, first of all, the community rec space, Los Alamos, that $9 million, it should say placeholder next to that. Um, just like the tennis court says $2.5 million. That, that's important because when we get to the list that we're going to ask you for feedback on, um, for purposes of trying to keep this exercise simple, we've limited that list to 10 items. And the, the North Mesa rec space and the tennis courts, you'll see on that list with different dollar amounts. And that's what I was talking about earlier. What we're seeing is some of our placeholders are much lower than when we get in and start doing design. And um, so you'll see different numbers when we get to that list. And I just wanted to highlight that now in case any of you notice later, 
That's not an accident. Um, so I um, also wanted to do a time check. We're running way past what I had hoped, but we're doing questions along the way. So I don't feel too bad about it, but let's try and get through the rest of this in maybe 10 or 15 minutes. So Julie, are you doing the survey stuff or Ann? Ann's gonna, Ann's gonna quickly share the survey results with us. Okay. Um, actually, we have one question I'm gonna allow first, if that's okay. Sure. Mr. Meadows, do you wanna ask your question now? Yeah, just a question. Um, so on that previous list, I, I guess I find it really, really hard to believe after all of the discussions regarding the issue uh, and the, the shade issue that it's the ice rink shade is not on the list. And then a second question would be, is it on the recommended uh, 10 item list that you're soliciting feedback for? I'll go ahead and address that initially here. Um, that project is currently not on the list, um, but that's what part of this process is about, is hearing additional community feedback. So um, the ones that we had on the list um, are, most of them are ones that are new, but uh, previously in process, um, I think is, as someone commented earlier, the shade structure has been evaluated actually more than once. Um, and you know that doesn't mean it can't be evaluated again and added to the list and, and actually occur. Um, it just isn't there as, as we speak today. Um, that's something we'll consider through the rest of the uh, our staff budget development process. Um, and then again, additional opportunities during the, the public hearings as well. Um, so when you see those list of 10 items, no, you won't see that one on that list at this point tonight. Okay. Um, so uh, there was a um, community survey that was initiated. We, we do it every two years. Um, and this was sent out back in um, November, December time period of 2022. Um, there were two ways to take it. One, you were part of a randomly selected statistically um, valid sampling uh, pool and received um, something in the mail, and then you could take it online or on paper. Um, the other way was then at, um, after that, there was a date where we opened up an online survey where anyone could um, uh, respond. And what you're going to see um, in the upcoming slides are responses to a couple of the questions, but it includes um, both the, the statistically valid and the additional um, surveys that were um, people took online. So um, question 14 asks community members to select the top three priorities, but this was based on council's 2022 council strategic priorities. They were very similar to what the 2023 one um, are, but they were worded a little differently. Um, and so <clears throat> this was what um, the, the uh, results were. Um, and it was 77% um, wanted to focus over the next five years on enhancing and supporting local business environment, opportunities for local business. 57% um, wanted um, increasing the amount of types of housing options in the community. 56% wants to invest in, in infrastructure. Um, 35 open space recreation and cultural amenities, 32% high speed, um, high quality broadband, 20% uh, communication, and 18% social services. And then, in addition to that question, question 15 was an open ended fill in. You could write whatever you wanted as a response. Um, but the question was um, thinking about the next few years. Um, what one capital improvement project would you like the county to pursue? Um, there were over 800 responses received on this one, um, and they were categorized. We've gone ahead and stat, um, categorized them based on the new council strategic goals and priorities to give you an idea how they fell out. So uh, Mr. Lynn mentioned the five over uh, goals of the council, economic vitality, quality of life, operational excellence, environmental stewardship, and quality governance. 
And so you can see 35% of the responses um, uh, were for economic vitality, um, followed by number two was 23% for operational excellence and 22% uh, for quality of life. So just to give you an idea in numbers, there was about, um, well, we'll see those in a minute. And then there were a few other categories where some people just said, I don't know, or gave some answer that didn't relate to a capital project. So we just put those either other or don't know. So 309 of those um, economic vitality um, priority responses related to economic vitality. And um, so we broke them down now from the goal into the priorities that fall under that goal, which for economic vitality is housing, local business, downtown revitalization, tourism and special events and community broadband. And to give you an idea, um, <clears throat> downtown revitalization, our responses such as, um, you know, eliminate vacant buildings or blighted buildings and replace them with something else. Um, local business would have been, you know, we want more businesses of this type or retail or things like that. Um, and you can see that certainly um, uh, downtown revitalization and community broadband were the, the top two um, with about a third each. And then for operational excellence, this really is um, where we put all of our infrastructure, take care of our infrastructure type for all categories. Um, so if it was an existing asset that um, the comment was take care of it or maintain it, it got put here, not necessarily under quality of life because it's really about maintaining the infrastructure we have so that you can see overwhelming re uh, response that um, that's where we need to be putting, the community would like us to put our attention. Um, quality of life priorities was next, 188 responses in this category. And um, with the uh, priority to open space, park and recreation, those were largely um, new amenities, not so much um, existing amenities, uh, ideas, and then mobility ideas about additional um, transit or connectivity. Um, and that's really focused within the community. There were a lot of comments I'll get to in a minute that are outside of our community, but we put those in a different category because they're not in our direct control. Um, and then for 69 of the responses were under quality governance priorities. And this is under intergovernmental relation, um, regional relations. That's where we put um, a lot of the ideas about needing additional roads out of town or egress or additional transit um, that's more regional related um, because it involves things like, maybe it was a sidewalk on, on West Hemez Rose. Well, that's not a road that we control. So that would be a conversation we need to coordinate with um, DOE because that's their, their asset. And then the last one's environmental stewardship priorities. We had 46 of them. Um, responses, uh, largely it was carbon neutral energy supply, a lot of responses on that, um, but actually natural resource protection was a little bit higher, a couple of percentage points, and um, that would be like wildfire protection um, was certainly of concern in, in this area, as well as protecting our open spaces from um, damage. And, And you can see, again, um, this is just a summary of the responses, 193 were focused on utility infrastructure, needing improvements for uh, 103 for fix the downtowns, 91 wanting high-speed broadband, 78 when additional parks, recreation and trail amenities, 61 improved transportation um, options, which were related to um, expanded transit and a bike, uh, basically bike and ped routes and wider roads that um, enhance mobility, not so much for recreational purposes. 60 want um, more assistance from the county for small businesses and, and the county to attract more uh, retail, restaurant, and entertainment to the community. 58 want more affordable housing in the community. And then 57 want widened and new roads to. Um, get in and out of the county outside of our boundaries. That's it. Okay. So um, here's here's a list of 10 potential new capital projects. Um, and, and these are the ones we're gonna ask for feedback tonight on. Um, 
few things I want to, I'll go through the list here in a minute, but I, I want to mention this goes back to the, the comment we got from Mr. Meadows. This is certainly not an exhaustive list. Um, our capital plan has much more on it, but these are some of the larger ones, um, some that have uh, either been out there for a while or had some, some work done. Um, this list is alphabetical. This is not ranked in any other way. Um, and again, uh, I think there was a question about timing. We'd envision these occurring over the next five to seven years. So um, well, part of what we're looking for is feedback on priorities. And so higher priorities might get done sooner. For example, um, these are also primarily new assets. And again, um, I've, I've, we've already talked about and, and heard about the need for us to maintain our existing assets I mentioned earlier um, the community uh, services integrated master plan that's going on. Um, I think there's a lot of maintenance needs out there that are going to come out of that plan as well that'll exert pressure on our capital planning. So getting feedback on potential new new projects is definitely something we're, we're interested in hearing about. So I'm going to run through the list real quickly and then uh, Julie will and then we'll go through final round of questions and answers. And then Julie will talk about um, how we'll run the, this survey. Um, so community broadband, I think Ann covered this earlier. It's a fiber to the premise, uh, open access network, which means um, if you wanna sign up with one of the providers, um, the, the goal here is higher speed, higher reliability, lower prices. Um, downtown parking, you'll see this is marked as a placeholder because we don't have something specific, but it, we there, there are actually in the recently completed downtown master plans, three potential sites and perhaps others. So um, definitely the the future of the downtown uh, might include some, some parking to help facilitate uh, some of the business growth. Um, Besides parking, um, downtown revitalization has also been highlighted as a need. And th this would take the form of mixed use development and or housing development. And the, and the county's involvement, um, depending upon the project, could occur in a variety of ways. Uh, Paul already mentioned if it's county owned land and affordable project, um, we could consider a donating or discount land for an affordable housing project. Um, it could uh, could involve uh, the county acquiring and and making re property ready for development. So it, it just again, it's a placeholder. The Hemis Mountain Fire Protection Project. Um, you may have heard this previously referred to as the Ski Hill Water Line. Uh, there's three components to this. Uh, the, the main one is getting water up to the top of the ski hill. Uh, along with it, there's a, a new tank that would go at the bottom. And uh, part of the mitigation is the third component. There's an electric line that's currently overhead. Um, it really needs to be in the ground and really should be upgraded to support the rest of this project. There's a 10 million gallon reservoir at the top of the ski hill owned by the owners of the ski hill. Um, be a great firefighting asset if it was reliably filled with water. And that's one of the primary goals of getting the water up to the top of the ski hill. Um, it just so happens there's a great secondary economic development benefit that it would also support snowmaking in the winter when there typically are not fires. Um, so it's, we view this as a big win-win project. Um, North Mesa Gymnasium, this is one I highlighted earlier. Again, this is uh, out at the middle school, a partnership with the Los Alamos Public Schools. Um, the current estimate is uh, quite a bit higher than the previous placeholder, though. Uh, North Mason Housing Infrastructure. Um, this is just east of the middle school. And again, um, early stages of discussion with the schools about feasibility, um, but we do have a placeholder for infrastructure to help support a project if, if it does get a green light to move ahead. Uh, Corey already described the social service hub, uh, more of a one-stop type shop. Um, tennis courts, uh, getting eight in one place. Um, the most recent estimates for this project are closer to 6 million. Um, Corey already highlighted the tween center 
and uh, the urban trail. Um, again, that's a right now most of our a lot of our developed trails in the town site uh, tend to run east west along the canyons. This urban trail would go kind of right through the middle of the downtown and, and uh, connect us north south. Um, quite a bit of grant funding already available for that project. That's a very quick run through. Um, I'm going to segue right to the next slide and ask if there's any questions about any of those or anything else. Any anything else? Here, I'll, I'll let me get the mic on just a um, And then when you're done, you can pass the mic. Yes, sir. Hello. My name is Monica Vandywater. I'm a Los Alamos Derby Dame, a former, um, a parent of a former hockey player, IRS member, and I also love public skating. So my question is, I'm going to give, say, uh, give you a statement. Given the similar popularity and importance of the ice rink relative to the golf course, there's a 4.5 million discrepancy. This 4.5 million difference. $4.5 million difference is more than enough to pay for a desperately needed upgraded rink and shade structure. Please explain this discrepancy, considering the ice rink has a higher popularity relative to the golf course. And why isn't this golf, the, the shading structure, everything on this list tonight? I'm so upset. What do we need to do? The golf course continually gets money. I see it again. They're allotted another $2.6 million. Why is that? Can somebody answer that? Sorry, I'm really nervous. That's <laughs> totally fine. And, I'm passionate, but not this bad. <laughs> I'm just nervous. It's totally, totally fine. I, I... For Los Alamos Derby games, um, in the summer, it's really difficult for us. So the concrete pad is crumbling. Last year was terrible. This, some sort of shading would help disperse the rain, the sun from us. A lot of times we have to cancel our practices because we have to squeegee the rink. And a lot of times somebody has to run up and go see if we can have practice that night, let alone not being able to have tournaments or games you know, we lose out. We have a big tournament coming up in Taos from all over the country. We have teams going there. It's huge. You guys are missing that revenue too, just like other sport leagues in this town. And this is the community's wishes. You had a poll. I'm really disappointed in the board and the county. Again, it's been how many years we've been asking for this? How many years? That's it. So I will I will go ahead and answer your question or attempt to. Um, in terms of the dollar discrepancy, um, there are two very different facilities and just have different needs. Um, and and where they're at in their life cycles and the type of assets there. Um, so there's all sorts of factors that that feed into that dollar discrepancy. Um, you know, at my Part of, part of the answer is they're both existing assets and most of the work that's needed to occur in both places is about maintaining those assets. Um, I will say the refrigeration, that was an improvement um, because that wasn't part of the asset before. Uh, but now that it's there, it needs to be maintained. And if it's at the end of its life cycle, it needs to be replaced. Um, the shade structure, part, part of what you need to do is what you're doing, providing this feedback to us now. Again, uh, I've mentioned that this, it's been evaluated. I, we hear... No, no. Um, I hear what you're saying. Uh, 
I'm not sure if there was anything else to that that I could help answer at this point. The rate is like three million seven hundred and ninety thousand. That's a huge discrepancy over twenty years. And they continue to ask us to keep that money. What do we need to do? The community has expressed over and over again. That's what we want. You have a pool that you provided, and we're still not on that list. Um. Part of the answer is we're not done with our process, and part of the answer is that's not an exhaustive list. So there is you'll you'll. I and I I hear it. I I definitely hear it. You'll see at the end of the survey. There's also an open-ended question. So feel free to fill that in as well. Uh, oh, after after this gentleman. Could you, could you wait for the mic just because this is being recorded? Go ahead. Um, I had a question, but now I have a comment as well. Um, all, all is welcome. My name is Cliff Fort Gang, and ma'am, I'd love to be able to talk to you maybe privately outside um, when we're done. I'm just as passionate as you are about the golf course as you are with the hockey rink. And as somebody who's been very involved with the golf course improvements, um, I've witnessed to my chagrin that sometimes the citizens of this community turn on each other like rabid dogs for for a few dollars, millions of dollars. But And I wish that that would stop. Um, I could tell you that the golf course community and the open space and trails community work together outside the official process of the county to come to some sort of compromises regarding the golf course and any expansion that may happen. So I hope, uh, I think with the hockey rink, there's not that place, but I can tell you for myself, and I think many, many, many other golfers, we support the hockey rink. We support maintenance of all the existing facilities. And it really, anything that requires maintenance should take priority over other th new things. Uh, you're just, well, anyway, that's my comment. And I would like to talk to you and discuss that $8 million. But anyway, here's my question though. You've made the point several times tonight that maintenance is a high priority. I'm not sure if you actually said maintenance was a higher priority than new capital improvements or not, but that's my perception of what reading between the lines, and you've gotten that direction from the council. So my question is, and I'll use the hockey rink and the golf course as two examples. There are two facilities that have not had the maintenance they need. Um, I don't know if it's the case with the hockey rink, but the golf course, in addition to its facilities not being maintained, is understaffed. So how does it work regarding funds? Where is the money going to come from to now that we've finally all seem to realize that we're underfunded to maintain our existing facilities? If we're going to put more money into the existing facilities, where is that going to come from? Is it going to come from capital improvements or is there another pot of money in the in the county? I would imagine it's a zero sum game at some level. How is this going to work? Because until you could. Until we have confidence that you could really fund the existing facilities and maintain them like you say you want to. How are you going to do that um, in a practical sense? Okay, a lot of parts to that question. I'll try to cover them. And if I don't get all the pieces, um, call me out on it and <laughs> keep asking. Um, as we do a better, and I think I alluded to this earlier, as we do a better job of assessing our maintenance needs and funding and executing our maintenance needs, it's gonna, it, it's gonna create pressure 
on our total capital dollars and, and mean that there's less immediately available for new items. Um, ultimately, it will be a council that decides uh, through the budget process. So including all this public input and all the input we receive during the process, um, we'll decide when do we add a new capital project um, and what's the expectation in terms of timing? Because it, it might be in our plan this year, but it might be planned for two years out. Um, one of the things that we introduced last year that we haven't done much of is actual debt financing for our general capital improvements. Um, it's a very typical practice in local government to have a regular bond cycle for capital projects. Um, because of our history, it's a little unusual, federal government came in here and built a community. And then after a while said, oh, here community, it's yours. So in many instances, uh, you'll see this in utilities. I know it's happened with roads, it's happened with our buildings. In many places, we're just getting to our first cycle of starting to upgrade and replace our own assets that were built by some other agency and given to the community. So that transition is, has some bumps and some awkwardness. Um, what you'll often see in a more, I'll just call it mature in terms of tenure, the community has been around longer, is a more regular cycle. Every four years or six years, They'll issue bonds and, and they'll plan for, you know, again, they'll have a, probably a 10 year capital plan. Um, and depending upon, again, all the assessments, they'll schedule out how they can get things done. And that's what we're working towards. Um, so I think what you'll, what you should expect to see is more being spent on maintenance and new, new additional items slowing down. Um, and a more routine um, debt cycle to help fund our capital plans. That's part of that's part of what will help us get through it. I don't know if that addressed everything that you asked, though. That was absolutely great. You really explained it very well. Okay. So you have a plan to fund capital improvements using bonds. You don't know how well that will work or anything like that, but you're working on it. And you're going to mean I'm using I'm trying to tell you what I just heard, but you're going to prioritize maintenance of the existing facilities. Yes, and there's still the, this conflict with the ice rink as an existing facility and it not being on the list. But nevertheless, I think you've you've heard plenty tonight, and I'm glad some council members are here. And 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 let me let me offer this because this came up. 12 years ago on, on the golf course. Um, it's an existing asset. How much of what we're doing out there is maintenance? I could, you know, and we often get into sometimes gray areas in, ter in terms of categorization. Is the shade structure a new improvement? Or is it maintenance? Um, I think it's a fair question to ask. Um, so that's something that we're going to consider. Um, do you want to pass the mic back to him so he could make his comment? And sorry for cutting you off. I just wanted to make sure you got captured. I have a loud voice. So you should have I'll, I'll use the mic. <clears throat> so I'm Chris Jeffrey at 122 Bronco Road. I decided to just follow up with one quick question because I've been involved with the CIP process. I was very actively involved with ice rink improvements and worked with the, the golf community with the, um, the rec bond. So the, the, the 2.6 million that you had for the golf course, that is the sprinkler system improvement that was passed as part of the, the last CIP. And, but it's, it's still ongoing. Um, I'll, cl <coughs> Excuse me, I'll clarify that. The golf course improvement projects had two phases. One was, all the um, irrigation, that piece was completed. The rest were the greens, the turf, um, the tee boxes, the cart paths. Um, that's the remaining two and a half million. And I can tell you that estimate is also probably low, um, but that's the remainder of the work to be done. And that's being, um, there's been quite a bit of discussion over the past six months with 
the community and council on that piece. Um, so we're we're planning to solicit for that work um, in the near future. And so, what's the time frame for the that improvement? Um, let's say we solicit here in the spring summer and trying. To, Corey, go ahead. You tell the the. the Juan, Juan will tell us the timing. Yeah, that's that's about right. Where you were going with that is so it's it's finishing, it's finalizing the plans really, and then being put out to bid, selecting a contractor, and then getting that work started, um, and then the second part of that, <coughs> um, as part of the discussions with the golf courses, is the netting, and that'll also just come back forth just for um, a discussionary purpose um, before the council. I don't recall. Um, so back when we did the CIP process, I thought that actually the ice rink improvements were about the same dollar amount, around say one to two million, as the golf course improvements in total, including the irrigation. Oh, Philo. So Philo's, in addition to being the utilities manager, is a former public works director. So. Yeah. Some of this history is scattered about. Go ahead, Philo. The old memo, because I saw the questions. Uh, you know, I was part of the uh, uh, rec bond projects, you know, where we actually looked at a indoor ice rink as part of that bond issuance. Back in, in 2017? In 2017. And uh, in December 5th of 2017, uh, council wanted to proceed with projects at that time and allocated budgets to four projects. There was eight projects on the bond program at the time. And uh, the splash pad uh, was budgeted at 720,000. Golf course improvements was four and a half million. The outdoor ice rink improvements, which was the locker room improvements was 1.2 million. And uh, the kiddie pool was at 5 million. And uh, so that was in 2017. All the projects have been completed short of the golf course phased improvements. Uh, so that that's just a little background. And I'd say, you know, the, that was an extensive process over two years to get to that whittled down list because of funding. You know, we're in a new funding cycle. We're back here before you all. Uh, that's, you know, there's always more things to do with all the facilities. And so, you know, receiving your comments is important. So thanks. All right, thank you. Um, after this gentleman back here, and then we'll bring the mic up to you. Hi, my name is John Stam. I just got a couple of comments about ice skating rink and the golf course. And then I do have a question for Philo because I don't want to fall asleep up there. But um, I like their ideas about what they need to do at the ice skating rink. All I can tell you is Steve is absolutely correct. We have been at the golf course on this for 12 years now. We have been going to these meetings. And the end is almost in sight for us, hopefully. So be patient, stick up for yourselves, advocate for yourselves, and we'll be right behind you. I think what you need to do at the ice skating rink needs to be done. Okay, I think you'll get there. Sometimes it takes a little patience, so. And I'm here to show it. I used to have a big head of hair up here. Yeah. It's all gone now, too many of these meetings. But um, Philo, I'm also a retired county employee. I spent 25 years in the electric distribution department. My question would be, and when we're looking at electrical generation in the future, why with the history of this town in Los Alamos, are we not looking at a small nuclear reactor to power up the entire needs of the county? Um, to answer your question, I. I joined utilities in 2019 and the uh, siting studies was done uh, a few years before I joined. Uh, but what I understood was majority of the reason was uh, availability of water for cooling, as well as uh, the seismic within this area uh, would be challenging to build that kind of facility. Uh, the other piece, I'll just say that the reason we're in with in membership with UAMPS, which is a whole collective of public power agencies like us, uh, is the power of partnership where we can invest in such a large project. The, the projects are still in the billions of dollars, uh, well beyond what we could afford to do 
Uh, now, there are other technologies out there that are looking at very small modular reactors, but they none of the designs are certified and they're still in the concept stage. Um, but you know, they, it it's possible down the road. Uh, but the, this seemed to be the opportunity that is in place at the right time for us uh, to take advantage of a, a little larger scale project to uh, uh, take advantage of that. Thank you. Again, observation. Been in this town 37 years. I've watched going back to, I think it's a model on facilities management that went back to the many years, early days. And that was 95 or more percent of the facilities are this. It's a, it's a building, not an ice rink, not a golf course, not the swimming pool. I think if you took a look at facilities management, I would do it differently. I would not do it the way it's been done. I see a new individual that's come in and Sarah Roten, she's hitting the ground running. And I think she'll have some impact on what I'm talking about. Because on IROS, we talked to the management and he says they meet with them twice a year. That's all they meet with them. He's not the owner of the facility. Facilities management is the owner of the facility. Where I come from, I don't, no way I'm going to go for that. That manager should be the owner of that facility. And if that owner cannot get the work done that needs to be done for him to keep that ice rink running, he says, I have the budget, company so-and-so, get over here and take care of the problem. That's what I think. I know you, there's things in the county, you probably can't do those things. But I'm just saying, I propose you would take a look at facilities management and how it's done with these three major facilities, because they're a lot different than running the air conditioning system in here, for instance, and the heating. That's it. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, Jared, you're unmuted. You can make your comments now. Thank you. I have a couple of comments and then a question. First comment is to correct the misinformation related to the golf course. While the golf course is a great facility for golfers in town, it represents a small demographic of the whole town. Not that the whole town doesn't support the golfers, but the golf course project got off the rails because it went into expansion territory and went beyond operational maintenance. They wanted to make a big, great Disneyland type situation and they were going beyond maintenance. Every taxpayer in this community would love to see the existing facilities maintained. We have invested huge amount of taxpayer dollars in the existing facilities, and when I say facilities, I mean broadly generalized definition, we wanna see them maintained. So correcting the, dot, the golf course discussion, maintain it, don't expand it. In terms of the ice rink, I am amazed that the community, the county, who runs around saying, we're concerned about the youth of this town, we wanna do this and do that, they don't understand the number of youth that actually use the golf course. And I'm, I'm astounded that the county manager gaslights the taxpayers by trying to say that the ice rink cooling was an improvement. That was what, 20 years ago I heard on this conversation? That's no longer an improvement. That is an existing facility that should be maintained. 
Now, I question the need for any kind of bonds. Why doesn't the county management put a moratorium on all new development until it gets its act together and maintains all of the existing facilities that need to be maintained. The county management seems to think this is an endless pile of money and there'll never be a dry spell. You guys are the fiduciaries for the taxpayers. And as you saw in your 2022 survey that just was presented by Ann, which was not completely honest about the results of that survey, that survey came in very negatively on the county management. I think the county management needs to wake up and do its fiduciary duty to the taxpayers. So when are they gonna put a moratorium on all new builds and maintain, get all the facilities maintained and then look at what the budget can afford? Thank you. And anyone else online? That was it. Any other questions in the room? Okay. Julie, you want to walk through this feedback process? Sure. So, um, oh, can you put the PowerPoint presentation back up? So we're gonna ask you all, considering that the county has funding and, and resource constraints to prioritize the level of importance for each of these new capital improvement project assets. Um, and then they'll, as Steve has mentioned, there's um, a question at the end that asks if there's anything else that we need to consider. Um, so if you wanna go to the next slide, there's two ways you can take this survey and um, we'd like for you to take it right now. <laughs> so you can visit this URL, lacnm.com forward slash CIP dash poll, or you can scan the QR code that's up there on the screen. And if you need assistance, I do have some sheets with the QR code that I can pass around to somebody if they're having any trouble. Um, and then if there's anybody else who would prefer to take a paper copy or complete a paper copy, uh, just let me know. We have a few here too. And this should take less than two minutes to complete. And once it's done, we'll go ahead and share the results. So if you wanna do that, that'd be great. Okay. So when you get in there, what you'll see are, are the 10 projects listed. And we're just looking for um, you to prioritize them. It lets you drag and drop them on the list. Um,
Ms. Jacobson, do you have a question? Sure. Uh, this survey, what other ways are these different projects ranked and then decided to be funded? It's pretty opaque so far on how you actually select a project or decline a project. So there's a number of factors and they and they change over time. So I'll I'll, I'll start um, back with our last major, um, I'll call it open CIP process when we were actually soliciting new improvement projects. Um, during that process, we developed a set of evaluation criteria, and uh, those were um, endorsed by the county council. There was feedback from the community about those. There was a CIP committee with a bunch of community members on it that helped evaluate projects and score them against those criteria. So it was a very formalized, what I'd call a, a um, sort of typical open CIP process. Um, that generated a lot of projects that, that were in the pipeline for quite a while. One of them was the golf course improvement project, for example. Um, since that time, a number of things have occurred. We haven't had a large open process since then. A lot of the projects have been, have been coming out of um, the assessments that we go through, um, other surveys, Sort of the last time things were, um, I'll call it semi-open was in 2017 when we had the, um, the bond project effort. So there's, a, a, again, quite a bit of public input at that point. So it's, well, a portion of it's driven by public input, a portion it's driven by our maintenance needs and the assessments that um, we go through. Um, part of it has to do with the ups and downs of funding availability. Um, I feel like I'm forgetting. That's a good point. Thanks, Corey. Um, there can certainly be regulatory issues that come into play for certain projects that um, might drive the timing or priorities. So for the list that's here, these are primarily new projects. 
Um, many of them are already in our capital plan. So what we're looking at is trying to get a sense of priority. Um, so there's, there's not a separate existing set of evaluation criteria, so to speak. One of the things that we'll do as we're developing our capital plan, we will consider all the input that we're receiving. We'll consider council's new strategic priorities. We'll consider the new citizen survey input and reevaluate the priorities given all of those inputs. So some of the timing of these might change from what they were, how they previously displayed in our, in our old capital plan. That's part of what we'll be looking at. Um, the other thing that also sometimes comes into play is just our capacity to execute. Um, we'll, we'll move something back or forward, depending upon um, how much capacity we have from that perspective. Does that help? Okay. Um, I think we might be close to done. Is, is everyone done with this at this point? I'll just mention we have another town hall Thursday in White Rock. We'll do the same survey. Um, I just checked with Julie. I think we're going to leave this open for the public for a couple weeks after that to gather a little more input. Um, we uh, will be also, I did not mention it on the slides here. Um, March 7th, we have a placeholder on the council agenda to do an overview of our CIP program. Um, so we'll certainly be sharing part of what we hear at these meetings with them at, the, at, at that and give them a little bit of a preview of what might be, what the uh, proposed budget might be looking like. So there'll be the council meeting on March 7th. Um, the last slide has a phone number our budget manager. Um, I'm hoping we can get an email out there. Um, again, we're open to the, any email input at any point, um, but certainly right now is very timely as we're in the budget development cycle. Um, so look for more contact info for us and, and our budget manager. Um, and any any last question? I want to thank everyone for uh, showing up and participating. The feedback really is important. Um, it, it's just a critical element to how we, we go about our planning. So Thursday, um, people. Certainly. Yeah. Yep. Any other? Any other questions? Julianne, anyone? Do we, are we good? Did we miss anything? I don't see any more hands online. Um, Julie, do you? Okay, we're going to share the results just so people can see. So this is just a start. Um, like I said, we'll be collecting these for a couple weeks here. Share. It's a little truncated here, but it looks like um, community broadband um, ranked the highest here. Then the North Mesa gym. Mm -hmm. It looks like downtown items. And then perhaps North Mesa housing, Tween Center, Urban Trail, Hemis Mountain Protection. Tennis courts and then social services hub. And here's the uh, cross matrix.
Julie, I'm assuming we have to run a report to see the open comments. Yeah. Okay. So we'll be sure to be compiling those and make sure that um, those are conveyed to council as well. Uh, yeah, when it's when it's completely done, it'll be online. Right now, it's sort of live and in process. So. Thanks, Julie. Yeah, thank you. And again, thanks everyone. Really appreciate your participation and all the feedback. Y'all have a good night. Thank you.